Welcome back to Historical Geology. For part two of the plate tectonic lecture, we're going to look at paleomagnetism, Earth's ancient magnetic field that's recorded in rocks. So just like this bar magnet is showing, Earth has a magnetic field. And the way magnetic fields work is that there are these lines of force that will leave the magnetic south, loop around, and re-enter magnetic north. So here are these iron filings align along uh, that magnetic force field. And note that the magnetic filings or the force field is near vertical at the poles, They're pretty vertical, whereas at the equator of the magnet, it's horizontal. That's kind of similar to what Earth has here. So in terms of Earth's magnetic field, note that um, we have a geographic pole and a magnetic north pole and that they're different. In fact, the magnetic north is independent of geographic north. And in fact, the magnetic north pole can fluctuate and move around. Uh, sometimes it even flips around and it comes down here toward this near the geographic south pole, right? And so that's when we get these magnetic reversals. And I'll explain that in a moment. But take a look at this term called declination. So declination is a difference between, or the angle between geographic north and magnetic north. So your compasses point to magnetic north, but you need to make a correction. San Jose area, it's about 13 degrees, so we're 13 degrees off of geographic north, so you have to correct your compass by 13 degrees or so. Note that, again, the magnetic lines of force are horizontal near the equator, but they're at very high angles as you approach the poles. The other term I have here is the inclination. In inclination refers to the dip or the angle that the magnetic lines of force make with Earth's surface. So they're very steep, about 90 degrees at the poles, but they're horizontal or zero at the equator. So at intermediate latitudes, like 30, 40, 50, 60 degrees, that's kind of like a proxy to latitude. So we can use the inclination that we find in lavas to tell us something about where they formed in terms of, of, of how far away from the equator. Now we have this term called the Curry Point. It's a temperature at which these iron barrier minerals, and those minerals are called magnetite, gain their magnetization. So when lavas erupt at a mid-oceanic ridge, we see the, the basalt lava come out and the magnetic minerals, magnetite, begin to orient themselves like little compasses in the direction of magnetic north. Then the lava cools below this temperature, 580 degrees centigrade, and that magnetization gets locked in. So we get a, a, we get a remnant, preserve that remnant, and that's what we call paleomagnetism. So, Magnetized rock will preserve remnant of that magnetization, so that ancient magnetism found in rocks. So ancient lava flows preserve orientation and strength of Earth's magnetic field at the time it cools. So it becomes a record of Earth's magnetic history. So paleomagnetism studies provide further compelling evidence that continents today have not always been in current position. Because when we look at the lavas in, in continental land masses, we see that their little magnetic minerals point to widely different locations on Earth, not toward the North Pole, right? So something tells us that these continents must have been in a different position when the lavas formed. So we see that uh, Earth is gonna have uh, two polarities, one during a time called normal polarity, like the one we have today. Our compasses point toward magnetic north up in the, in the geographic North Pole, but in the past and at different times in Earth's history, we've had reverse polarity where uh, your compass would point to magnetic north, but magnetic north would be down in the geographic south, down by the south pole pole. So, uh, so normal polarity is what we have today. Reverse polarity is what we had in the past. And again, it's switching about every 500,000 to about maybe 700, 800,000 years. And so we are sort of overdue for a reverse reversal because the last one occurred 780,000 years ago. So here's an example of a lava flow that erupted and the little magnetic minerals align themselves in the current orientations of, of magnetic north, which is over here by the North Pole. And then another lava flow erupts, this one on top here, and the magnetic minerals are pointing in the opposite direction. So now we see a reverse polarity. So these lavas, the magnetic minerals point to geographic south. And we see another lava flow here later on, and that's back to a normal polarity, another lava back there. So that's how it works. You get this normal, reverse, normal, reverse, and we get a, um, essentially a fingerprint of, of Earth's magnetic history in the, in the geologic past. In the 1960s, the plate tectonic revolution, 
where we brought back this idea, this old idea of continental drift, Harry Hess proposed that the seafloor separates at, at these mid-oceanic ridges. And his hypothesis was called the seafloor spreading hypothesis. And he said, well, new crust is forming by upwelling magma. So as the ocean crust breaks in two, new magma comes up there to make new seafloor. And then uh, he made a couple of predictions. He said, well, because the ocean floor is dynamic, there should be no, no ocean floor older than 200 million years old. And in fact, we, we drilled all over the ocean floor, and about the oldest ocean floor we find is about 180 million years old um, because that ocean floor is eventually subducted into a trench and recycled back into the mantle. One of the questions I have is, what is the ultimate fate of the ocean floor? It's to be subducted in an ocean trench. He also said, well, if the ocean basins are as old as continents, if they're three, three and a half billion years old, then, then based on how much sediment is coming into the ocean from rivers or wind, then uh, based on that amount of sediment coming into the ocean, there should be about 15 to 20 kilometers thickness of sediment in the ocean. But when you actually measure the sediment in the ocean, there's only about 500 meters, less than half a kilometer. So right away, the oceans are dynamic. That means they're not sitting there collecting sediment. They're moving. They're recycled back into the mantle. He also noticed that there are only young underwater volcanoes. These things called seamounts. They could be extinct or active underwater volcanoes. They usually have like a peaky point. Whereas the geos are also underwater hills. But these are former volcanoes or really former islands that were volcanic but we're, they're now submerged above, above sea, below sea level. But why are there no old ones was his question. And he really kind of came up with this, um, you know, he and other scientists really figured out, well, at mid-oceanic ridges, you get this upwelling magma. The seafloor breaks into new magma, forms new seafloor. If, if, if enough magma is being issued, you might make a volcano, a seamount, here, a conical shape. And if that volcano, if that magma is enough to make an island here, then the, you get this volcanic island. Over time, as seafloor spreads, note that it's warm and I call this thermally buoyant because it's hot and it expands. But as the seafloor moves, it gets older and colder like a conveyor belt here. And the, the island is carried away from this, this topographic high, this hot spot, and then it starts sinking below sea level and wave action will, will erode its surface. So that's what the little cartoon is showing up here. We have uh, the volcano forming, and then as seafloor spreading or the, or the tectonic plate moves and carries this volcano away from this thermally buoyant region, uh, wave erosion starts flattening the surface. And then until you get this geo right here. So the geos are these flat table mounts, right? Eroded by wave action. So the, he was able to use this to, or, or seafloor spreading to help explain how these geos form. Another thing that we look at are these magnetic anomalies. And, and what we find is that they, they're stripes of magnetized basalt lava on the seafloor. And they, they're parallel and symmetric around the mid-oceanic ridges. This suggests that new oceanic crust forms along these spreading ridges, these mid-oceanic ridges. Deep sea drilling confirms this. The older sediments are deeper, younger on top. But more than that, the older sediments are farther away from the mid-oceanic ridge. Younger sediments are closer to the mid-oceanic ridge. And so that's what this is showing here. So here's, we're going back 15 million years, and here is a time where the lava erupts, and this yellow lava cools in a time of a reverse polarity. So here we have a reverse polarity, this yellow. And note that uh, here in the modern example, the anomalies, the yellow band or yellow stripe here has a negative anomaly. That's because the, mag the magnetic minerals in this rock here are pointing toward geographic south when magnetic north was near the geographic south pole. But then uh, these br brown areas are when t a time of normal polarity. So the next lavas that erupt here, we have a magnetic positive anomaly because the magnetic minerals in this magnetic stripe here are pointing toward geographic north because that's where the magnetic north is up near geographic north, right? So that that's, makes a positive anomaly. So we find that the seafloor has these negative anomalies, positive anomalies, negative, positive, and it's just showing that 
the, sea, the lavas are obtaining their magnetic signatures at this mid-oceanic ridge, either during a time of normal polarity or, or reverse polarity, breaking into and moving away. So you can think of these as twins, like these two gray reverse magnetized rocks were once at the ridge as one were split in two and they've, they've since moved away from the mid-oceanic ridge. So that's really a strong criteria that supports this seafloor spreading and hence moving continents. This picture here, we see uh, the age of the seafloor. So the red band here right at the middle, well, that's brand new. Here's the East Pacific Rise, which is a mid-oceanic ridge in the Pacific Ocean. And here's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, so that's new seafloor. You can see that the, the farthest away, this darker blue areas, that's where the seafloor is about 180 million years or a little bit less than that. So note that they're gonna be farthest away from the ridge axis, farthest away from the ridge axis. That's where the ocean floor is oldest. Looking at plate tectonic, this unifying theory, because it really explains much of the phenomena we see on Earth, it relates ocean trenches with volcanoes. It relates uh, uh, the Hawaiian Islands and how there's only one active volcano. And as you go to, from the Big Island of Hawaii to, to Maui, uh, Molokai, Oahu, Kauai, the volcanoes are older and more eroded. In fact, that's because the whole Pacific plate is moving over a, a, a thermally buoyant hotspot in the Hawaiian Island region. Now, a question that I always ask on the exam, and this is, this is more of a short answer essay question, I ask you for the three basic concepts of plate tectonics. And I'm not asking for the plate boundaries, uh, I'm asking for the three basic concepts. The first one is that we have these rigid tectonic plates. So whenever you see this lithosphere, lithosphere means rocky or stony sphere. So the lithosphere, those are the tectonic plates. So we have these rigid tectonic plates, the lithospheric plates. These plates move with respect to one another and, and it's slipping on this thing called the asthenosphere. And the asthenosphere is sort of this weak, in fact, this word asteno means weak. It's a Greek word for weak or debilitated. So it's a soft, um, it, it behaves so like a solid and a liquid at the same time. It's a region that directly underlies the tectonic plate, the lithosphere, and it provides the lubrication for plate tectonics. So think of the asthenosphere as a lubrication for plate tectonics. And finally, number three is most deformation occurs at the plate tectonic boundaries. So that's where we see the, blade, the plates crashing into each other, grinding against each other, pulling away from each other, right? Hot, mantle, hot material the mantle rises, heat is transferred to the asthenosphere, which drives the lithospheric plates laterally like luggage on a conveyor belt, right? So we're, we're going to have this process called um, mantle convection. So I always say that tectonic plates move really mostly by convection. So this, these heat currents, so there's lots of heat generated in the core and in the mantle from mostly radioactive decay, that internal heat engine. And as that heat moves up, uh, it's, it's going to move laterally when it reaches the base of the, of the lithosphere. And that's where the asthenosphere resides, this weak sphere of Earth. And it's going to be the lubrication because as the asthenosphere moves, it's going to kind of push or pull the tectonic plates along, right? And then when the, when the asthenosphere gets cool enough, it starts moving back down. So it'd be an ocean trench or what we call a subduction zone. So one is this convection in the mantle. The other one is we have this, this ridge push because remember these mid-oceanic ridges are thermally buoyant, so they have a higher topography. And so there's a push of gravity that's pushing this ridge down in both directions. So that's gonna help with moving tectonic plates. And then the ocean floor, remember it's getting older, colder, denser, heavier as it goes into the trench and gets recycled back to the mantle. So there's a pull of gravity from this big, in fact, we call it a slab, once, it, once it's subducted, so it's pulling material back into the mantle. So ridge push, slab pull, and then the convection in the mantle. That's what's helping tectonic plates move.